Turn your Bible. We're going to be starting in the 33rd Psalm today, Psalm 33. And as you're turning there, what's the difference between George Washington and a duck? I know you've pondered this many, many times, right? One has a bill on his face. The other has his face on a bill. What did the colonists wear to the Boston Tea Party? They wore T-shirts. Come on. You know you're going to repeat that one. What do you get when you cross a dinosaur with fireworks? As the great J.J. Walker would say, dynamite. Come on, y'all know J.J. Walker. You have to know J.J. Amen, amen. So this morning I want us to talk about America. Past, present, and future. You know, as we prepare to celebrate another birthday for for this great nation, it's vitally important for us to never forget all of the incredible blessings, all that God has done for us in our glorious past. But we must also be vigilant. We must also keep our eyes open to see what God is doing in our nation today. And we need to be mindful of what God will do to America in its future. Amen? Our past, our present, and the future. Let's pick up in the 33rd Psalm. Skip down to verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of any army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. So America... Thinking about what God has done in our past. We are a nation full of wealth, full of privilege, full of opportunity. And we need to make sure that we never forsake, we never forget that this is all from the generosity of Almighty God himself. Amen. God makes it clear in this psalm. Our safety, our our wealth, all those things that we have, all the things that we have been blessed by is because of his almighty hand. God has done two major things for us as a nation. Number one is that he literally birthed this nation. Amen? He formed this nation himself. We sing that great patriotic hymn, My Country, Tis of Thee. Who is the thee? We're talking about Almighty God, aren't we? My country, tis of thee. My country, tis of Almighty God. It's he who gave us and established this nation. The first colony ever established in the United States was in Jamestown, Virginia. Jamestown's first building that they, that they built in the community. Do you know what it was? It was a church house. Amen? The first colonists to ever establish a city in this great land, the first building, the community building that they built, was a church house. In fact, it's the only original building from that colony 
that still has one wall standing today. Amen. The only public building of all the, thi- all the buildings that they built in that community, the only one with a wall still standing. Think about the Puritans. You know, when they landed on Plymouth Rock in Plymouth, Massachusetts, their first action was to drop to their knees, to kneel down, to pray, and to dedicate their newfound home to the Lord. Amen. Roger Williams, a pastor, he established the state of Rhode Island. Billy Penn, William Penn, we're all familiar with William Penn, aren't we? Being in the tri-state area. William Penn, a Christian, he founded Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, and Connecticut. When writing Pennsylvania's uh, uh, government's policies, he wrote, all treasuries, all judges, all elected officials must profess faith. In Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? That was his requirement of those states in which he established. Of the original 13 colonies, 12 incorporated the entire Ten Commandments into their civil and criminal codes. President John Adams. He said, the law given from Sinai, he's talking about the Ten Commandments, given to Moses on Mount Sinai. The law given from Sinai was a civil and municipal code, as well as a moral and religious code. These are essential laws to the existence of men in society, and most of which have been enacted by every nation which ever professed any code of laws. Vain indeed would be the search among the writings of uh, scholar history to find so broad, so complete, and so solid a basis of morality as the Ten Commandments lay down. The American Bible Society, still in action today. The American Bible Society was actually formed by an act of Congress And President John Adams served as its first leader, its first president. President George Washington, he said, It is impossible to govern a nation without God and the Bible. One of my favorite men in history, one of our our founding fathers, Patrick Henry, also the first governor of Virginia, He said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our nation's motto is what? In God we trust. We pledge to that red, white, and blue flag. What do we say? One nation under who? One nation under God. And this nation was formed. This nation was birthed by a divine act of Almighty God. Amen? Secondly, what has God done to this nation? He has blessed this nation. Not only did he bring it into existence, but he has blessed it through, it, through, through the many years our, of our rich history. But today's history books, they remove this truth. They remove all the mac- miraculous accounts of God's help throughout our, uh, uh, the years of our history, the, the early days, the early struggle of those colonists that wanted to break free from the tyranny of Great Britain. Those founding fathers that wanted to create a land of the free and the brave. Let me share one such account. In 1776, British commander uh, commander William Howe was moving 30,000 
of his troops to take New York. General George Washington only had 18,000 inexperienced men to defend it. In the first clash, Washington lost 1,000 men and his top two generals. Their morale was crushed, and they were trapped. They were surrounded. However, without explanation, the British troops all of a sudden halted. Washington and his troops only had one escape, and that was through the treacherous East River. The weather was horrendous, history states, making the East River almost impossible to cross. General Washington called his, com uh, his, gen his uh, uh, commanders together, bowed down on their knees, and they prayed for guidance. In faith, they headed for the river in the raging storm. Historical accounts state that at 11 p.m., the wind and the rain suddenly stopped, and the river became smooth as glass. As soon as they boarded their boats, a gentle wind came up and blew them from behind and helped push them along the river. They rode all night, but they still needed to hit Manhattan without the British noticing them. Just before the sun arose, a thick fog came in. That fog covered them. It completely hid them from the British troops. General Washington and his troops safely escaped. Washington gave God all the glory for that entire night. He openly recognized God's divine hand and his blessing upon the establishment of this young nation. But even in that deliverance, let us never forget that 1,000 men still gave their life. Freedom is never free. It always comes with a very, very steep price. In the history of our nation, We've lost just under a million lives. Men and women who bravely fought on the front lines. Sacrificing their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy here and now. Amen. Let us never forget. God has birthed this nation. He has blessed our nation in the past. What about today? What is God doing today in our nation? Plain and simply, he is watching, and unfortunately, he's also withholding. He's watching and he's withholding. He's watching closely, and he's taking account as we as a people, as we as a nation continue to drift further and further and further away from him. He's patiently watching. As we openly reject him as a nation, instead of seeking after him and becoming better, year after year, we certainly fall away from him and become bitter. We shake our fist in his face, and we've become a bitter people instead of a better people. And because of our lack of obedience, he's also withholding his blessings from us. Remember, God's love is unconditional. Amen? There's nothing that we can do more to make him love us. There's nothing that we can do to make him love us less. He loves us unconditionally, but his blessings upon us are conditional. Amen? Jesus said, if you love me, then what? Keep my commandments. 
We have to trust him. We have to obey him in order for him to bless our lives. So today, God is looking on. He's watching us. But he's also withholding his blessings from us as a people and as a nation. Because of our disobedience. Because we've chosen to kick him out of our nation. Here's a sad fact. Our service men and women in both Iraq and Afghanistan. They were safer in those two war zones than they are in all the major cities in the United States today. How sad is that fact? Our men and women in uniform were safer in an actual war zone than they are in our major cities today. Cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, Los Angeles. Every single night, these cities see multiple murders in a single evening. Sad fact is that there is a murder in the United States every 25 minutes. Every 25 minutes. And it seems like more often we, say, we see satanically influenced shooters go into our schools and randomly take lives at an alarming rate. We've kicked God out of our nation. And we have to understand with that goes his almighty protection. And then when these tragedies happen, we sit there and we ask, why? Why is because we kicked him out and his almighty protection. God is allowing us to see what happens to a nation where he is not Lord, where he is not God over. So what's the answer? Is it, uh, is it religion? Absolutely not. Amen? One thing you know about me is I am not for religion. Religion, by definition, is man-centered and not Christ-centered. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. You have to do this. You can't do that. You have to say this. You have to, all these different things. Man's attempt to reach God on their own, and it can never, ever happen. Praise God for Christ. Amen. Jesus, God in the flesh, came down to us to meet us in our needs, to meet us in our sins. We think about religion. There are more religious churches in America today than ever before in its history. Are we better off? Not even close. Not even close. So religion is not the answer. What is it? Is it education? Not anymore. You think of our universities. Our greatest universities, the Harvards, the Princetons, these Ivy League schools. These universities were originally established in our great nation for one purpose. That was to teach our students, our children, how to read and understand the Bible. That was their established purpose. Now they indoctrinate our children with ungodly, atheistic, and anti-Christian ideology. They don't teach. They indoctrinate. So what is the answer then? It's not religion. It's not education. The answer is still the same today as it was from the beginning when Jesus declared, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. 
Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way for the lost. Religion has and always will fail. Amen? Confucius, Buddha, Mohammed, they are all dead. Their bodies, their bones are in their graves. But praise God, the tomb of Jesus Christ is empty. Amen? The tomb of Christ is empty. He has overcome death, hell, and our enemy. He's overcome the grave. Jesus and Jesus alone, he is our hope and he is our way. He declared, I am the way. He also said, I am the truth. So he is the way for the lost and he's the truth for the educated. In a world full of uncertainty in a world full of deception we can be comforted to know that Jesus is an absolute and he is absolutely steadfast amen he is our absolute standard of truth he is the absolute standard of wisdom and understanding he is the absolute source of of peace and love. Amen? Hebrews 6.19 This hope that we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The hope of Jesus Christ is sure and it is steadfast. Jesus said, I am the way for the lost. He is the truth for the educated, and he is life for every single one that trusts in him. 1 John 5.12. He who has the Son has life. Amen. God's not talking about the flesh and blood. He's not talking about this physical life. He's talking about eternal life. Amen? He who has the Son has eternal life. And yet most fail to come to the way. Amen? Most are not finding truth. Most are not receiving eternal life. Most today are choosing to openly reject Jesus Christ, the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Jesus painted a very clear picture. He talked about life gives us two roads. One is very narrow. That road leads to eternal life. You have to enter in at a very straight gate, very narrow gate. And Jesus said there are few upon that road, and there are few that find that gate. Who is that gate? It's Jesus himself. But he said that second road is very wide. And it has a very broad gate. And he said that many are on that road. Most are on that road. But he said that's the road that leads to eternal destruction. And as sad as it is, that's because most are openly rejecting him. Amen. We live in the greatest nation upon this earth, a nation with a rich history of faith, a nation with a rich history of of faithful founding fathers, rich with Christian heritage, a nation that has been divinely blessed, 
supernaturally protected, a nation of great privilege, where anyone can walk through those doors and freely hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Anyone who chooses. A nation of great opportunity. And Almighty God is watching us. He's taking account. And he is giving us what we have been asking for. As we continue to tell him, you are not welcome in this land any longer. God is peeling back. And he's peeling back his protection. He's also withholding his blessings. As well as those protections from this land. He is giving us as a nation what the majority of this nation is asking for. A land without God. So that brings us to what is our future? What does God tell us will happen to us if we continue down this path? Well, history is full of wreckage and ruin of nations that have rejected and that have forgotten God. The book of Deuteronomy gives us an incredible outline. Deuteronomy chapter 8, skipping down to verse 18. God was talking to the children of Israel. And he said, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant with which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Then it shall be, if by any means, if you by any means forget the Lord your God, And follow other gods, and serve them, and worship them. I just want to pause right there for a second. We need to understand that not all gods come in human form, do they? Anything that we put before Almighty God is a god. It can be... A sports team. It can be a movie star. It can be a hobby. It can be anything that we put in front of Almighty God. And God said, I testify against you this day. If you follow other gods, you serve them, you worship them, that you shall surely perish as the nations with the which the lord destroys before you so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the lord your god we look at the history of the nation of israel god's chosen people how many years have they suffered for turning their backs upon holy God. Hundreds of years, thousands of years, they've gone in and suffered persecution and captivity when they chose to reject God, when they openly chose to kick God out of their nation. God removed his protection from their presence and they went into captivity from other nations. And they suffered persecution after persecution. America, we need to understand that we are no different. In fact, we're even more privileged. Amen? We have the entire complete word of God. We've been established as a Christian nation. And we have to understand that we will be held accountable 
The Bible makes it clear that we will give an account. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Every single man, woman, and child, we all, it's a child above the age of accountability. We all have an appointment with Almighty God. Amen? We all have a future appointment with Almighty God. No matter what you want to believe, what you choose to believe, truth is still truth. Amen? And God is telling us that we all have a future appointment with Almighty God. The question is, are you ready? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In him is how we get ready for that appointment.